Uh, there are call-in lines for that. Uh, normally our ministers are online helping me out, so I know one of them going to type in the call-in lines for you. If you don't want to do Facebook, you can call in on the telephone. If you'd like to support our ministry, you can do that. Of course, you can go to our website, www.sofintl.org. That's www.sofintl.org. And there's a give button there. You can also give through Cash App. Our sign is uh, number four dollar sign S O F I. Number four dollar sign S O F I. Uh, support our ministry if if this word has been helping you and and you enjoy our services. Let us know that that we've been doing something for you. Now, I'm not going to give a lot of more announcements. We'll have announcements maybe later or one of our ministers will do. I have a quick word for you I want to give to you on this Wednesday night. So if you have a Bible, we'd like to start all of our service by making a confession of faith. Our confession of faith doesn't put pressure on God. As a matter of fact, it reminds us and the devil what God said. The Bible teaches that whenever the word of God goes forth, that angels go out to cause it to come to pass. So when we make our confession of faith, we're just reminding ourselves and the devil who we are. So repeat this after me. Say, this is my Bible. It's God speaking to me. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the uncompromised word of God. I boldly confess I am a doer, not just a hearer. I am above and not beneath. I am the lender. I am the lender. I am the lender and not the borrower. I am the head and not the tail. I am the victor. I am the victor. I am the victor and not the victim. I can do all things. Come on. I can do all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, the devil can do about it. Now, come on, shout hallelujah. Hallelujah, amen, amen. Now, I'm going to be starting a new series uh, this Wednesday, and I'll be doing this on Wednesdays. Now, I don't teach accidentally. Uh, I really try to be led by the Holy Spirit. And what I'm teaching on Sundays and what I'm teaching on Wednesdays, though they might not be the same thing, they'll be connected together. So on Sundays... In these difficult times, I, my series has been uh, what you should do in difficult times. And right now I'm talking about preparing for victory on Sundays. Because God has showed me that the next few months might be or will be difficult times for America and the body of church. But there might be trials and tests and tribulation come coming in the next few months. But if we prepare correctly, as these few months come, on the other side of them, we will have great victory. So on Sundays, I've been talking about preparing for victory. Now, on Wednesdays now, I'd like to start uh, talking about, um, probably turn, turn, turn the sound down just a little bit for me, honey, on, on here. Uh, on Wednesdays, oh, no, man, I just do this. I got it. Okay. On Wednesdays, I'm going to start, start talking about the way you think. Thinking like a winner. Dr. Meyer told me we have a little static. A lot of times if I have a little static, it's because my volume is a little too loud. So hopefully by bringing my mic down a little bit, that fix that and the volume should be a little bit better right now. Amen. If you're still hearing static, then put in a note so that Dr. Meyer can, can hear, can get that. And she's working in the background to fix it. I thank her so much for her work. Now, I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel, chapter 17. 1 Samuel, chapter 17. Now, we're going to be talking about David and Goliath. Uh, it's a story that all of you should be familiar with. Uh, it's, we learn it in Bible school. You learned it in Sunday school. So it's a real... real uh, familiar story as we look at it right now as we prepare to go into this lesson. Now, as you know, the 
the, the, the children of Israel and the Philistines are, are in a war. They're battling one another. But they get to this one place, and the Philistines are on one side, and Saul and his army are on the other side. And then there's a valley in between them. And in this valley in between the two armies, the scripture tells us this story that the Philistines have this great warrior called Goliath. And everybody says he's so big that two people have to carry his, his shield and his sword is so big. And he's a big guy, a giant. And this giant comes down in the valley every day and challenges Saul and the children of Israel to come and fight. So we're going to pick it up at 1 Samuel chapter 17. I want you to go, go to verse 8. We're going to pick up that story. So now this is Goliath talking to Saul and, and Saul's army. Goliath says, why have you come out to, to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to meet me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then he will be your, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now let's look at verse 11. It says, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So I want you to try to get a picture of this situation and I'm sure that, that you've studied it before. Saul's on one, Saul's his army on one side, the Philistines on the other side. They send down this big guy. Say, hey, listen, we don't all have to fight. Just send down somebody to fight me. If he beats me, then we'll serve you. If uh, I beat him, then you all got to serve me. And then he does this day after day after day. And when Saul and his army hears this, the Bible says they are greatly afraid and dismayed. They're like, oh, man. They, they, I mean, it freaks them out. They don't know what to do. Now, David's going to come into the picture. Now, actually, David's brothers had been in the battle. And David had been back at home. And David's father had sent David to take some food to his brothers who were in the battle. David gets there and he and he kind of he sees what's going on. He says, "Well, what will I get if I do this?" And and eventually, uh, David goes to talk to Saul about what's happening. Look at verse thirty-one. It says, it says now now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul. And he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him or because of Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now, that's amazing. David gets there and all the army is afraid. And David says, okay, hey, wait a minute. He's, he's been talking. People say, hey, the guy down there want to fight him. So David goes to the king. He says, no sense of being upset. No sense of being worried. I'll go down and I will fight him. David said, hey, I'm ready to go for the battle. Now, it's, it's kind of strange that David and Saul and Saul's army, they both looking at the same Philistine in the same valley. When David looked at him, he's not any shorter. Uh, when David looks at him, his sword don't get any small. His, his shield don't get any smaller. No, it's the same battle. So David and Saul are facing the same battle. But for some reason, David responds to the battle differently than Saul. Look at verse 33. And Saul says to David, you, you are not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him. For you are youth, and he a man of war from his youth. So Saul says, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just a young kid, and this guy has been fighting his whole life. But here's the thing. Saul is looking at the battle minus the God factor. David interject, interjects the God factor into the situation. Stay with me. I'm going to take you somewhere with this. So look at verse 34. 
This is one of my favorite verses. When David said to, but David said to Paul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard, struck and killed it and killed it. He says, your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the power of the lion, from the power of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Now, here's what I want you to get. David and Saul and Saul's army all see face the same situation. But there's something about David that says, I can overcome this situation. Even though it might look bad, I can go in and do something about this situation. David interjects the God factor. Uh, David is different than Saul. So how is it that when facing the same situation, their responses are totally different? See, I believe this has, more to, it has to do with more than just going, going to church. I think David had learned something that he applied in that situation. I believe that David had learned how to think like a winner, that, that David got into a situation, and when he got into a situation, that he had taught himself how to think like a winner. See, if, if I could teach you, or if we could learn how to think like winners, we could truly begin to obey God and live out God's best. Uh, I, I could almost call this story a Dr. Myra story because I happen to, to, to marry a wife who thinks like a winner. When we face a situation, she faces a situation, uh, she always like, let's go again. Uh, she used to tell me when we first got married, well, I had a problem now, but when we first got married, she would say, well, if, if you apply for a loan and somebody else say no, hey, we'll go to somebody else. If they say no, we'll go to somebody else. She just had this had this attitude of we can win. If that didn't work, let's try something else. If that couldn't work, let's try something else. And, and I had to learn over time to develop this way of thinking so that I thought like a winner. So what I'd like to do in, in the next few weeks is to teach you how to transform your thinking process so that every situation that you face, you go into it knowing that you can win. In these next few months, as the world goes through what I'll call birth pains, as we go through COVID-19, and as we go through social and, and racial uh, justice, as we confront injustice and racism, as we go into the coming uh, presidential election, as we go all into all of that and, and we reach a firestorm of activity in America when it looks like things are, are going down, I want you to think like a winner. I want you to get this attitude inside of you that says, no, whatever I'm facing, I can win, that I'm going to win, that I'm going to come out on top. I, wa I want you to just begin to look at all situations and begin to think like a winner. Now, those of you who know me, you know I'm a teacher. So as a teacher, you know I like to give definitions. And I want, you, I want you to know exactly what I mean when I say something. So when I say think like a winner, here's my definition. Here's what I mean. Here's what winning thinking is. Uh, write this down. I know, I know they're going to probably put it in the notes, but you need to write it down, put it on your mirror. This is winning thinking. Winning thinking is taking in information and evaluating that information 
against my core belief system and making a decision that will cause me to walk in God's best in that situation. Hear me now. When you face it, so see, winning is not being blind. I'm not asking you to, to close your eyes to what you might be going through, what you might be facing, what it looks like. That's stupid. Don't do that. So, But you, when you think like a winner, you take in the information and you evaluate that information against your core belief system, against what you believe. Then you make a conscious decision that's going to cause you to experience God's best in that situation. It's a systematic process that you can apply, that I can apply, that I learn how to apply. A lot of it, I have to admit, I learned from Dr. Meyer, who maybe learned from her mother. I mean, I watched her, and, and I know I gave her a hard time when we were early married, because I might was not as positive about situations as she was. Or well, let me say this. Uh, I was on this level. She was on that level. And, uh, well, let me put it another way. I would buy a Ford, she would buy a Cadillac. If she go buy a car, I, I'd buy a Ford, she'd buy a Cadillac. Go buy a TV, I'd buy 15 inch, she'd buy 30 inch. So, because she just would take it to another level because she always kind of thought of the best. And she began to teach me, and I began to follow her in learning how to live God's best. And as I began to take the scriptures and apply it to my life, I, began, I was able to transform my thinking so that no matter what the situation, I begin to think like I can win. Win. I look at the situation. I evaluate the situation. What's going on? What did they say? Then I look at what I believe. Then I make a conscious decision that I'm going to go through this experiencing God's best. Now, whatever God's best might be in that situation. Uh, God best, God best might not be that I get the house. God best might not be that I get that car. But whatever God's best is, that's what I'm going to experience in that situation. Are you with me? Amen. Now, now, actually, what the Bible tells us is that our prosperity is connected to how we think. Uh, 3 John 2 says this, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. So your soul and, and your health, your prosperity is connected to how you think in. See, you, you got to begin to think differently. And in line with what I am teaching on Sunday, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, when you accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you stepped out of normal life into eternal life. God sent his spirit into your spirit, crying out, Abba, Father. And you actually became a child of God. You entered into the kingdom of God when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But now, that, however, does not mean that you'll necessarily, necessarily experience abundant and, the, and a victorious life. I know lots of saints who've been to church all their life. They wear white all the time. They got so much oil on them, you can pull them through a, through a keyhole. But they don't experience victory. They don't experience the abundant life. But they love God. God loves them. They love Jesus Christ, but yet live defeated lives. Well, I don't want that to be you. I want you to begin to think in such a way that you are victorious in every situation. Romans 12, 1 says this, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and perfect will of God? The, the, that renewing of your mind, that, that transformation in your thinking means that I, 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 if I'm going to renew my mind, I got to learn to think differently. If I'm going to have God's best, 
I have to think a certain way. I got to transform. I got to go through a metamorphosis in my way of thinking so that I can have God's best in my life. Do you know that even your peace, even the peace that you experience is connected to how you're thinking? In Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, it says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Hear what the word says. It says that God will keep you in perfect peace if you can keep your mind, if you can keep your thinking stayed on him and you can trust in him. So there's something about the way we think. And you can be, I'm, I'm not telling you can, you're not saved. You can be saved, sanctified, full of the Holy Ghost, and think like a loser, loser, loser. That's not going to be you. We're not coming out of COVID-19. We're not coming out of racial injustice. We're not coming out of this election. We're not coming out losers. We're coming out winners. And you got to begin to think like a winner right now. You got to know that God's going to bring me out on top. I am the head and not the tail. I am the victor and not the victim. You got to get that planted in your mind so that you learn to think a different way. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says this. Listen to this. It says, For though we do not walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Listen to this last part. This is really good. You already memorized this. Bringing every thought in the captivity to the obedience of of Christ. Now, this tells me that just going to church is not enough. That just singing in the choir is not enough. Or just being on the usher board, that's not enough for me to live a victorious life. I got to capture and control how I'm thinking. Listen, I'm not letting the white man, the red man, the blue man, no kind of man hold me down. I am a child of God. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. In the Listen, when Reagan was in, I made it all right. When uh, Bush was in, I made it all right. Trump ain't going to hold me down. And the next thing going to hold me down because the God I serve was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he holds the, the, the hand of the king in his hand. And for me and mine, we're going to prosper because we're going to think about prospering. We're going to find a way to have God's best in every situation. Are you with me? Now, you see, Isaiah 58 says this about God. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So see, even God says that my thinking has to be superior. If, 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 if you're going to be a child of God and God thinks I have superior thoughts, as a child of God, because now I have the geno of Jesus Christ in me. I'm going to raise up my thinking process and begin to think a different way. Amen? Amen. I, I know I'm running out of time. I don't want to run late. So, so just give me, let me, give me 10 more minutes. Give me 10 more minutes and I'll let you go. No, because Jesus taught us how we should be thinking. Jesus gave us a great example of how we should be thinking. I want you to turn in your scriptures, please, to Matthew chapter 6, verse 43. Matthew chapter 6, verse 43. Now, in Matthew 6, 23, Jesus says, but it says, but first, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Or the, the, the Amplified, I think, says, 
uh, God's way of doing things and being right. And all these things, everything else that you need will be added to you. So I got, so if I'm going to think right, I got to find how God does things. And I got to do things the way that God does them if I'm going to think right. Are you with me? Amen. Now, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's get back to what you're thinking, to thinking. Now, remember what I said about winning thinking. Winning thinking is taking in information about a situation, an experience, or, or a situation, and evaluating that information, experience, or situation against your core belief system and making a conscious decision that will cause you to walk in God's best in that situation. You, you got that. So then, I got evaluated against my core belief. So my core belief, what I believe on the inside is important because that's how really I evaluate information. So my core belief is what I accept to be real, my reality, what's real to me. Uh, uh, what I hold to be true, uh, what I perceive as actual, uh, what my convictions are. Uh, that's, that, that's my core beliefs. So when I, when, when I face a situation, when I face a challenge, when, when I face an obstacle, I'm going to look at that obstacle and I'm going to evaluate it against my core beliefs. What I believe is true, what I believe is real, uh, what I believe affects me, and I'm going to evaluate it against that. Then I'm going to make a conscious decision to seek God's best in that situation. Are you with me? So where do I get my core beliefs from? Go to John chapter 20. We're just about there, and I'm going to pick this up next week. Go to John chapter 20. I just will end up right here at this, at, at this story. Got about two scriptures. John chapter 20, go to verse 24. Now, here in John, you know the story. Jesus had been crucified, and he had risen from the dead. And actually, he had gone in and saw the disciples, and all of them had saw him, uh, but uh, Thomas was not there. Thomas called one of the twins, was not there. So look at John 20, uh, verse 24. Says, now, now, Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Then the other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, Thomas has established a core belief. He said that, Unless I can see it for myself, unless I can examine him for him for myself, uh, he Tam, Thomas was from Missouri, you know, the show me state. And, unless you can show me, I will not believe. So now, when somebody says I will it not or I will, that is a conscious decision to do something. So he's made a conscious decision that I will not believe. But believing is always a matter of your will. What you decide to believe. You can will to believe or you can will not to believe. Believing has little to do with evidence but all with what you choose to do. See, I, I, I say this in church. Sometimes I, I could bring a person in with a doctor and the doctor could certify that this person is blind and cannot see. I can bring another doctor in that could certify this person is blind, cannot see. I could pray for him, put oil on him. The person could jump up and see and, and, and read. And some people will believe, but other people will say, I will not believe. I was listening to a lady on the radio today and they were talking about COVID-19 and that everybody should be wearing a mask. And she said, I don't believe you can have a mask. So well, all, of, all of the experts say you should wear a mask. Well, I, I, I don't care. I don't believe they need a the mask. Uh, they said, well, what about the increase in the cases? I know the cases might be, might, might be 
going up, but I don't believe that. Because some people just decide. You make a decision on what you're going to believe. But if you're going to have God's best, you got to adjust your will for what you're going to believe. So here's what happens. Go to verse 26. We still in Matthew. Go to verse 26. It says, and after eight days, the disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came through the door being, the door being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach out your finger here and look at my hand. And reach out your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord, my God. So now, Thomas has gotten, he's gotten evidence. He's touched Jesus. Uh, he's seen the wound. So now, so now he's like, oh, oh, yeah, that is you. But Jesus says, you got the wrong criteria, man. Don't be like unbelieving like that. And then verse 29 says, Jesus says this. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, because you have verified me with your senses, you believe. Blessed or enabled to prosper or empowered to prosper. He said, blessed are those who have not seen, not been able to verify with their senses, and yet have believed. So Jesus identifies for us as Christians what biblical believing is. Biblical believing is that I, that, that I'm, I believe God regardless of what I see. I don't need to see it, touch it, experience it. I just need God's word. So I'm going to make a decision by my will that I believe what God said. That whatever God said is true regardless of the circumstance the situation, the challenge, the mountain, my reality says that God's word is true regardless of what I'm thinking. So now, so now I've changed my core belief from I got to verify it to know I got to know that that's what God said. See, I made, I made a switch. I made a switch from the world's way of, of core believing. The world's worst way say I got to see it, I got to touch it, I got to have it. No, no, the God's way of saying no, you just got to have God's word, God's promise on it. If you got God's word, God promise on it, then it's more real than what you can see. Because the Bible says everything that was that's seen is temporary. Things that are not seen are eternal. So then Hebrews 11, 1 says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So I got to renew my mind and learn how to walk by faith if I'm going to begin to think like a winner. I, got, I, I have to know what God said about my situation, renew my mind, take my core belief, make an absolute conscious decision. My core belief is based on what God said. I think that's what David learned when he saw that giant. When David said, the God I serve, he delivered me from the bear, he delivered me from the lion, that he'll deliver me from this uncircumcised Philistine too. He said, uh -uh, my core belief, I know he big, I know he a warrior, but my God said he'll deliver me. That my God is bigger than this, that, that we can get through this. So whatever giant you might be facing, whatever giant you might be facing now, whatever giant you might begin to face in the, in the, in the months to come, I want you to be able to stand, look at that giant like David said, and say, I killed the bear, I killed the lion, this uncircumcised Philistine, I'll be just like one of them. I want you to begin to learn how to think like a winner. So that when you face something, you I, I don't I look at it, I here's what it is, but my God's gonna bring me out on top. 
in the next few weeks, step by step by step. As I teach you on Sunday to prepare for victory, I'm going to teach you on Wednesday to begin thinking like a winner. Join me here. Don't miss a service. And God's going to change your life. Amen? Amen. You believe. I, I like the way Joel Osteen say, you believe it, you receive it. Amen. Listen, if you're here and you've never given Jesus Christ a lot, never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your Savior, your Lord and Savior, what a wonderful night to make a decision to give your life to Christ. He loves you so much that he died just for you, just as you are right now. You don't have to change nothing. All you got to do is make a conscious decision that I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us that if we confess him as Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So why don't you just say this short prayer with me? If you just say, Jesus, come into my life. I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. I believe that you died on the cross just for me. And on the third day, the power of God raised you up. I accept you as my Lord and as my Savior. Amen. Now, if you said that, that, that prayer and you really meant it, a wonderful thing happened. God sent his spirit into your spirit, crying out, Abba, Father, and you actually became a child of God. Now what you should do is get yourself into a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church. You should tune in to me whenever I'm on, whenever I'm online. Hit the button and say, whenever Pastor Scale's on, I got to hear what he got to say, and I'm going to teach you the word. If you can't get me, get to another Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church where you might learn to live out this Christian walk. Listen, I'll be here again on Sunday at 1130. We'll be talking about uh, living a victorious life how to prepare for victory in this coming situation, then I'll be here again next Wednesday. If you'd like to support our ministry, please do so. You can give through Cash App at uh, number four, dollar sign, S-O-F-I, number four, dollar sign, S-O-F-I, number four, dollar sign, F-O-F-I, is that right? I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure that they put it in if I got it wrong, or you can go to our website. Uh, God bless you. Look in the comment section, Dr. Meyer said, and it's putting it there. God bless you. Hey, look, look, I need to be encouraged. So, so send me a, send me an inbox. Uh, type something in the comments line. Let me know that you're listening, that this word makes a difference. Because I'm here by myself with Dr. Meyer, but I feel like I'm reaching out all over the world. So I need you to reach back. Let me let, let me feel your drawing on my anointing. I want you to respond and, and let me know that you're there. God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah.